So yeah, just just carry on saying what you said before, because the question I'd asked you at the end of the previous video was about what you feel Reggie Labrie could um, improve upon, even though he has done very well so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I read just I've obviously done like like really good jobs like so far and that, and I do like the bloke and um, I like the way he talks and and everything. But um, yeah, yeah. My only little like. Like minor concerns and frustrations is like lack of subs, the timing of subs, and also maybe sitting back in like 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 far too many games like recently. Like aside from the Oxford game, we do seem to like like sometimes like maybe like give like some invite too much pressure for our liking. Like, yeah, certain games I understand. Like obviously Luton, like away for example, you understand that because of like the quality that they have and obviously their style of play. But some teams are not like Preston, for example. We give them far too much respect. Yeah, I mean Luton, for example, as we as we mentioned, like the tightness of the of the Kenilworth Road pitch, it kind of suffocates you a bit, and it gets on sort yeah. of on top of you. And it's actually quite funny because Luton, however crap they're doing at the minute, they I think I think we're the only team who have gone there and won since August, I think, which feels quite weird. I may have to check that, but um, if that's true, then that feels very weird to say, um, given how badly they've started, but. Yeah, I mean, look, in terms of Reggie Labrie, as you mentioned, oh, by the way, guys, as you may have noticed, um, the second part of this video, we are, the lighting's a bit different and we're wearing different, well, I think Thema, you're wearing the same same shirt, but I'm yeah. wearing a different hoodie. So, like, that is because, well, let's just ignore the fact that it was just due to not being able to download the second part of a recording of a video we'd done earlier, um, which Skype wouldn't let me uh, download. So hopefully this has. So just ignore that and just pretend that this has all gone seamlessly as possible. Um, <laughs> isn't yeah, but there you go. Um, I guess to sort of ask the next question is, um, actually, here's what I want to ask you, because I was talking to a friend about this, and actually this is something that when we spoke earlier, I didn't ask you. At least I don't think I did. Who's been your top five performers so far this season? Ah, uh, but Yeah, yeah, what, what we tried to do before, I did mention, like, like uh, I think I mentioned, like, what, like, one or two and that, but straight away, I would say, play, like, number one for me, player of the season for me, Job, I think Job's been absolutely outstanding like, like this season, like really mm -hmm. stepped up, mature, was a lot more physical as well than that, I mean it's a shame about the red card against KPR because that's probably the only bad thing he's done So, yeah. okay. um, I would say I think Chris Mepham has been absolutely fantastic since we've got him on loan, I mean that was some fan fantastic piece of business to bring him in like plenty of experience in both Premier League and Championship and hopefully Pipping, uh, Pipping a parachute payment team to get him as well Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Sheffield United. And fingers crossed in that. We hopefully get him there at the end of the season. Hopefully. Well, hopefully uh, as a Premier League player at Sutherland next season. But we'll see. Yeah, yeah hopefully. But, uh, uh, no, number three, I would say, uh, I'd say Dennis Serkin. Uh, I, I think Serkin's like beaten. I mean, at times he's felt like a new side. And I mean, keep him fit. And that on his dear, I think he's one of the best left backs in the division. Although what I would say about Dennis Serkin is, and I think you, you touched upon it, um, like in your video about the Coventry game, I, I don't know. Like, like what if, 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 if some people might not agree with this, but even though Serkin scored an absolute worldie of a goal against Coventry, I actually think that was his weakest game, personally, in my opinion. Was it was it him who got beaten by Jack Radoni for the Eagles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a bit he was a bit weak at the back stick with Jack. Yeah, I, I did think that. I think he could have been a bit better in terms of strength in there, but, but that's nitpicking though. In general, Serkin, as you say, if, if you keep him fit, he literally is like a. Um, he literally is like a new signing. It's, it's quite oh, yeah. mental, really, when you think about it. But so obviously the, the, the challenge there is literally to keep him fit. But whether yeah. we do or not is a different matter. But anyway, sorry, so that's three of them. So you've mentioned Job, um, Mephim, Job, Mepham and Serkin. And which, who would be your other two? I think Wilson Isidore's got to be like up there and that. I mean, I mean I, I, we mentioned this um, either in first video or... Like second one that did not like. Yeah, like, whichever one of the videos we we able to re we recorded before, whichever one was downloaded and which wasn't. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, Aceto only seems to score like worldies, like like lately in that. But like, yeah, like very physical target man, but also very skillful and got like got some really good pace about him as well. Especially like all against Hull, which was like really really good. Thierry Henry esque, and that if I do say so. Um, yeah, Aceto's definitely up there. The fifth one, I'm kind of torn between, like, I'm kind of torn between two. Actually, no, I'm, I'm torn just between three. It's between Mundell, Rig, and O'Neill. Ooh. 
I'm glad you said this because when we and my mate were talking about this the other day, he mentioned seven players and it's the exact seven you've just said. And he felt uh-huh. like he couldn't leave. It was hard to leave Rick out, hard to leave all nine out. I'll tell you who mine is. To Mine would be number one would be Joe Bellingham. I think he's been, apart from the red card against QPR, I think he's bossed the midfield this season for us in a good way. And I think we've definitely missed him the last couple of games, to be honest. Um, second is Chris Metham. I think he's made a massive impact since coming in. And I think, as I said earlier, you know, Sheffield United were wanting him and they've got the parachute payments. So I think to be able to pip, to be able to pip them at the, at, the, at the end, to get him, pip him at the post, in other words, to get Metham was really, really good. Third for me, oh, it's a tricky one, this. I think third for me, in terms of consistency, it probably would be Dennis Serkin because of the fact that, you know, with the exception of probably they for the equaliser against Coventry, I think he generally has been really, really good this season and obviously scored a, got a couple of goals. I wouldn't bet against Serkin getting about five goals this season if he's fit consistently oh. enough. Um, fourth, I would have said Wilson Isidore. Yeah, you know, I mean, he, he only... Um, he only literally scores like only like just, you know, world class goals. I mean, come on, sort it out, Wilson. Get yourself 10, get yourself 50 goals this season. Um, no, seriously, <laughs> great. Um, yeah. Well, as I mentioned before, someone who likes, for example, Russian, we both agree probably that he's more of a wide player than a striker. Yeah. But when he has played up front, he's not an outlet. And Wilson Isidore has finally been the outlet we've needed since Ross Stewart was, yeah. although I still think justifiably was sold, we still missed an outlet ever since Stewart was sold. And when Stuart yep. was fit, you could definitely notice someone who was able to sort of hold the ball up, run the channels, bring others into play really well. And I think Wilson Isidore is as close as we've had to that. But he's generally been very, very good when he's playing through the centre, which is quite funny considering that I originally was sceptical about the idea that we might have signed a winger who could happen to play up front. And I think now recent games has kind of quashed that and gone, nah, he's a, he's a centre forward now. Like, having watched him, he's a centre forward. Um, and the fifth one for me, I probably would just pip it to remain Mundell. Not because of the fact he's obviously, I think he's got seven goal contributions. I think he's got four goals and three assists. Okay, yep. one of the assists was for Serkin, who basically did the work against Coventry and ran and scored a screamer, but it still counts officially as an assist, as yep. an assist. So, I mean, to be not... fair, two assists against Coventry. So. Well, that's what I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah, he assisted um, the first one. So, point is, for me, it's not even just that. It's who he's had to step in the shoes of, where... If you yeah. remember when Jack Clark was sold, back when the team lineup was announced against Burnley and Mundell was in there, and you go, right, go on then, Mundell, see what you're about then, mate. And yeah. to be fair, it says, in my opinion, quite a lot about the fact that we are gutted that he's injured because that yeah. says how well he's done. And it's a funny thing how we've barely mentioned Jack Clark, as mentioned before, since since he's been sold. So yeah. I think Mundell's done exceptionally. Obviously, the, the Mundell and Clark are kind of like they're kind of different wingers in the sense that, you know, Clark is, Clark, I think, technically has a little bit more ability, but obviously to be fair, well, probably has quite a bit more ability, but to be fair, he's two years further along in his development than what Mundell is at the minute. I think Mundell, because I see the argument about, oh, Mundell's better than Clark. Right now, no, he's not for me. I don't think Mundell is better than Clark right now. He's got potential to be. I think he's got potential to be better than Clark, depending on how his development. He has goes. got more peers. That, that's one thing I will say. Peers I think he's going to be a Clark for. I will say this, and I'm not saying yeah. Mundell's crap, by the way, because he's obviously not. He's not definitely, not. he's definitely a really competent top end championship winger. But um, you know, I think the point is he's done really well to step in when Clark's left, and he's provided goals and assists, hasn't he? So hopefully he can do that when he comes back from injury, and hopefully he doesn't get injured again. Um, but to be fair. I think Rig didn't make me top five only because, while I think there's been flashes of brilliance, he hasn't been as consistent as someone like Job has for me. Yeah, yeah, um, but to be fair, but and that's not that's not a slide, by the way, because it's his first full season in Ben's football, really, isn't it? Yeah. You know, he's only had sporadic appearances last season, but you can tell the quality's there for all to see with Rig. And 09, I felt guilty missing 09 out because I think, even for example, away at Preston, when I thought a lot of our back line struggled, I thought O9 was the one who stood out in a good way. I thought O9 bailed us out at Preston quite a few times to get something. Um, and I think now, I don't see O9 as a midfielder anymore. I think there were some calls earlier on a few in the last couple of years to put him in midfield when we were short. Not for me anymore now. I think he's a defender. Primarily a centre-back. Maybe a full-back when he needs to be. But I think as well, it's not just the fact he's come with us from being in League One. He's also like really shown he's actually got some his quality is quite underrated, I think, for this yeah. level. He's got. I mean, obviously, he's not the most. He's the most technical player in the world. Of course, he's not. But I think he's. I think he's. He's really good at bringing the ball out from the back. I think he started to avoid 
wrestling people to the ground a bit as much now, which I'm hoping that yeah. continues because that was the one thing last season that let him down for me, um, or the main thing that let him down. But he's and and when he proves those diagonal switch balls out from defence, he actually is pretty good at them. Most part, not every time they don't land every time to where they're supposed to. But in general, I think he's been really promising. So, but I, I think you'll agree though. That this is the conversation you want to be having with the players, don't you? You want to go top five. Oh, hang on, but he misses out. Oh, but that's harsh on him. You know you, that you want that because it means that we're doing well. You know, and another thing oh, yeah. you mentioned, yeah, and another thing sort of to bring it back to Cruz out on Reggie Labrice is like. We joked about the manager of the month curse because we got, he got it after beating after winning the first four games and then we lost against Plymouth and then he got it right before playing Coventry and we threw away a two 0 lead. But as you pointed out, rightly so, the more manager awards he wins per month, it means we're doing better and hopefully at the end of the season he's won manager of the season, which means we've got promoted. So that's the again push wood. So yeah, well, we'll see. Um, right, I guess to sort of start to to move towards the end of the video, because obviously by this point, once I've put it all together, providing this all goes well, this will be about probably, four, we're probably about over 40 minutes in at this point. I want to ask you this. I'm not going to ask you whether you think we're going to get top two or whatever else, because it's still way too early days. But as my as my question, as the title suggested, are some promotion contenders? Now that could mean top six or top two. For me, we're top six contenders. Top two depends on whether we keep ourselves in the mix over the next nine to 11 games going into January and crucially what we do in the January window. So top six, definitely top two depends on the factors I've just said. Yeah. 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 I completely agree. And that's like, like top two and that obviously yeah, like we need better luck with in, injury suspensions. Obviously January will, will be obviously like, like Kate, hey, I haven't any chances like, like top two. I mean, that's the thing you could have a great January window and you might still miss out on top two. That's just the way like things are, but it'll give us a better chance if you do have a solid January window. But, but yeah, at the minute, I think we, we are like promotion contenders, but I am leaning more towards definitely top six, but top two remains to be seen. Yeah, I think, well, as we mentioned before, I think, look, even if you got, even if you had a great January window, you missed out on top two, you've still got the playoffs to go for, haven't you? So those yeah. signings in January could help you win the playoffs. So, this is one thing we have mentioned before. That, like, like I said, for me, I think I would be, I'm at the point now where I'd be pretty fuming to miss out on top six at this point. Yeah. And I think barring anything disastrous happening, I think we will get top six. I think we will get playoffs as a minimum if unless we go, unless we um, go full Dodds ball or Beal ball between now and the end of the season and really crash, come crashing down with a whimper. But, I'll call some 1-1 one, one, Jack Ross style. Oh, God, imagine that. You know, like, we'll be unbeaten for the rest of the season, but with 31-1-1 draws. <laughs> then, like, if we drew every game for the rest of the season, we finished on 62 points. So, yeah, you wouldn't get playoffs with that, would you? It's nowhere near enough. You could probably just scrape top 10 if you're lucky. Probably. Well, the good thing is we're not going to get relegated. You know? <laughs> Do you remember how, how, how crap the end of last season was, where we went from, oh, hang on, we could really challenge for playoffs, okay, and then we went to... How many more? How many point poor points do we need to make sure we don't go down? Jesus Christ! Yeah, exactly. That was just absolutely horrendous. But I guess to sort of start round it up, really, I think this is why I mentioned like someone you criticised Speakman in particular, for example, before, and for things that are very, very criticism worthy. As anyone knows who wants to put up with my waffle when I've talked to Sean on the aftermath towards the end of last season, and this is from someone who's been one of his biggest defenders, so defenders, so to speak, like. I've, I was criticising him heavily at the end of last season because, and I think a lot of people weren't justifiably because of the Beal appointment and the arrogance that was shown on that Beal appointment. I'd like to think he's addressed the idea that, OK, they overlooked massively the connection with the head coach and the supporters because to, to a club like Sunderland with the passionate fan base we've got, that does actually matter. It matters a great deal. Um, but also because not getting the focal point up front since Stuart left, um, you know, so there are some things he definitely deserves criticism for. I still am of the opinion that ever since he's come in, well, him and Stuart Harvey, if you look at what we had when we played Wigan at home in the 2021 season in the lockdown year, that was the first game after both of their appointments or after Speakman came in. And if you look at the team we had that day when there was no saleable assets whatsoever, and then you look at what we've got now and the squad that's worth multi-multi-millions, really it's our best chance to close the gap while we're in the championship to the parachute teams. But to sort of flip it, January for me will is quite testing in a different way. I said at the end of last season that the summer was a regime defining summer, and I and I stood by that. And I think 
for the most part, they've largely seemed to have delivered. Um, there's obviously still things, areas we can do with depth in, such as right back, maybe another winger as well, and possibly another midfielder. There are still depth issues, but for the most part, when you look at signings like Isidore and Metham, for instance, they do seem to have delivered for the most part on that front. So I think, I remember, like if he like comes back and he contributes. Well, that's if if Sam Ed, if that's if he's good as people say he is, because I have no idea about the bloke. I've never watched him play football, but I am aware that he's been a Champions League regular before. So, or at least he's played in the Champions League. So, I think I would say that this is the problem. As long as some people don't like the model or the strategy, whatever phrase you want to call it, because I know everybody's sick of those words. But this is what I'm talking about when the model in the model in action is when, say, you sold Clark in the summer, but six months prior you signed Mundell who was effectively his replacement, well, not effectively, is his replacement, um, gave him six months to bed in, and you've signed Clark's replacement for a f- replacement for a fraction of the price you sold Clark for. Yes, it's including add-ons, but 20 million quid you got for Clark. So you've got Mundell already through the door, and the money you got from Clark means you can go for higher quality loans. And to link it back to January, that means that when we say go for it, and I think, I think you'd agree, within reason, as long as you don't go and do what, say, Hull did last year, because I did say last January... Yes, Hull are making some good loan signings, but they're really banking on going up this year or bust for them, really. I'm not saying they'll go down to League One or anything, but if you look where they are now, they're, well, yeah, they're outside. But, uh, to be fair, it is a very tight league, but they're outside the bottom three on goal difference. And their squad isn't anywhere near as good as what it was last year. When you think of Cavallio, um, Delap, Savori, J- uh, Greaves as well, Philogene. Yeah, yeah, they're missing five, They're missing a lot of quality from last season. Whereas Sunderland's approach, I think this January, if we do it within reason, I'd like to think you would probably agree with me. We'd like us to go for it a bit and actually go, yeah. you know, again, because we've still got some of the Clark money left, remember? Like the loan fee for Methan wouldn't have been cheap, probably the same for Samad and maybe for Isidore. But also you paid, like, was it Abdullah and um, Alexic? So even if you take all those things into account, you should still have some of the Clark money left to go for it in January. And when we say go for it, I think you could mean two or three top draw loan players, like bottom end Premier League level loan players, that sort of yep. thing. And Sunderland should be able to attract that in the championship, shouldn't they, as a club? In the well, championship. Well, like, like, well, yeah, well, like, there's a few reasons behind it. Like one, like because it's obviously Sunderland's like massive club, but also if you are in the mix for top two, then uh, then you, uh, it's going to make it easier to attract top talent and that like to come and be a part yeah, of absolutely. a potential promotion journey. Yeah, no, you're right. And I think even if you didn't make top two in the end, you've still got the opportunity to go up, haven't you? Which is yeah, yeah, play- which is through the playoffs. So I think this is why we need to keep ourselves in the mix coming into January. And I think, like I've said before, I mean, look, we know about the Millwall game. We know about what issues we're going to have for that game. But afterwards, providing Job doesn't get a fifth yellow card, providing we are streetwise enough and we don't get any, in- any and we don't get many injuries, if any, which is a big ask, I know, but. You've then the team would be exactly the same as it was before. It's just Watson's probably in place of Mundell or Russian, whichever. For me, even though Mundell's injured and I'm gutted that he is out for a while, but it looks like he could be out for a while at the time of recording, it could be Watson's opportunity, couldn't it? And yep. yes, okay, he's delivered in the academy. First team level is very different, but you need to start somewhere. You need to get a bit you need to get you need to get sort of minutes somewhere. And I mean playing him on the left, not shoehorning him on the right like he was against Preston. Because although against Preston he got bullied, I thought, he wasn't helped by the fact that Labrice thought, you know what, I'll play him right wing. <laughs> because, you know, and I can understand the thinking behind it and that you wanted to play Isidore on the left. But the point is, when it comes to January, this is why, and we both said this, when you compare the top, of the, when you compare the league this season as compared to last season, especially in the top four, like the standard's nowhere near as good this year, I don't think. And I think if you compare the table last season, I mentioned before that Leicester won the league on 97 points. Ipswich got 96. Leeds got 90 points. Southampton got 87. Can you remember West Brom and Norwich got fifth and sixth? Can you remember the points tallies they were on? Yeah, it was like like seven, like 75, 73, something like that. Okay, correct. Yeah. yeah. West Brom were on 75. Actually, it's funny. West Brom finished fifth last year, and that's where they are now, which is quite funny. <laughs> but... No, West Brom were on 75 and Norwich were on 73. So between 5th and 4th, there was a 12-point difference. Yes, Ipswich overperformed and they did really bloody well to do what they did. But 
there's a reason three of the top four were the relegated sides because the squads were freakishly good at championship level. There were a lot of players, especially for a lot of those those three teams, that shouldn't be anywhere near the championship, really. Yep. So this season, you're looking at the three relegated sides now. You're looking at Luton, down the bottom, Burnley, Parker Ball, and Sheffield United. <laughs> and, I mean, look, as I said to you before, though, that, that penalty against Swansea might be a good thing in the long run because it keeps Parker in a job for the time being. Yep. So, you know, they need, we need them to get just enough wins to make sure they're in the playoffs, but to have them drift further away from the... From the Power ball and wins. Sorry? Po- we need power ball and wins from Burnley. Except against Sunderland in Except January. Except against Sunderland, yes. Yes, that's the game they need to lose. But um, in, all joking aside, though, like, you look at Sheffield United, every time I've watched them, I've not been convinced by them. Um, I know their level went on points with where we are. Obviously, it went for the points deduction. They would be further along. But, like, I watched... Do you remember, I think I asked you this in the recording that we didn't get to use. Remember that they played Leeds after the October international break? They got... If you remember that game, I think you said you watched it. They got yeah. battered that night. Yeah. Like, Leeds could... If Leeds had won 5 or 6 nil, they couldn't have complained. Yeah. And that's why I think, personally, my head is, I still think Leeds get one of the automatic promotion places. And for me, it's about who joins them. Although I'll say this for Leeds, though, the pressure is massively on Leeds this year because... This is the this is the second year of their parachute payments, and if they don't go up this season, then they could be buggered, couldn't they? So it's yep. it's it all depends. But obviously the caveat is if Ipswich come down, if say Southampton come back down, if say Palace for example come down, just any of them lot down the bottom come down, the league in my opinion at the top is going to be tougher a standard next season. And this is why, and I think I don't know, I'm going to guess see what you think. So we've we've got probably I'd say five ten minutes left, but. For me, and I think you've agreed with this, this is Sunderland's best chance to go up. Even if you've got the five-year plan, which the first year was 21-22 when we got up from League One. The second season was 22-23 when Baldy walked out. Then you got um, the third season, which was last season. And then the fourth season this year and f- year five next season if we don't go up this season. But for me, this season's a massive opportunity, isn't it? With the standard of the league. Like well, it is, especially that, like the way we started off the 15 games and the fact that there was a strong poss. I mean, maybe not, but but there was a strong possibility that we could still be top two or maybe third or fourth. You know, come like January, and that's the thing. You never say never, but there's a likelihood that next season, with like you said, the teams that could potentially come down, we we might not be in as good position. We might be just fighting just to get in the top six, but like next season. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, like you said, they've still got that extra year for their plan. But why not when you're in a really good opportunity now, like? I just grab that opportunity and just ha- have a go. Try and go for it now. So, so and it puts yeah. less less pressure on this lot to deliver next season. Well, exactly because also if say for example when you if you go for it within reason and you don't go up, then you can go well. It's not going to set us back so many years. Like I keep comparing to Hull. Hull went for it, and because they went for it and and they didn't really think much longer than the next six months in advance, they're now kind of paying for that, in my opinion. Whereas I think Sunderland are in a position where if you went for it within reason, then next season we should still have a chance to go at least go for a top six finish again. But I just think, I agree with you, I think this season it's a massive chance with how poor the league is and how, or at least poor in comparison to like last season and potentially what next season will be. I think this season is Sunderland's best chance for, and could be for some time, to try and get into the Premier League. Because you know what happens when teams come down from the Premier League? The parachute payments are just way ahead of a lot of teams at championship yep. level. So, you know, I'm I'm begging the Speakman and KLD and all that in particular, take it in January. Um, yep. You know, and again, like, for example, if you look, so the last question I'll ask you before we start to wrap it up, and this time we'll try and wrap it up within a few minutes, because every time I say that, I waffle on for 20 minutes. But um, what, what positions do we need in January? And if you can think of any targets, who would you want us to get? Um, we could definitely do with... Uh... And another winger, and that's like maybe like a versatile one. I mean, straight away, well, well, I mentioned this like like bef- like before, and that's but obviously like pe- people hate it like for the first yeah, time. Yeah, people aren't going to see that. But so for yeah. people who haven't seen it, what was your but, suggestion? But I think Poku, like from Peterborough, would be a really good like option and a realistic option like for Sunderland. I mean, you said he's like, only got like six months left on his contract. Yep, his his so, contract his contract expires in June 2025, so that's next summer. And I don't believe there's a year's extension option either. That, or at least none that I know of. Yeah. 
Yeah, so obviously you've, you've got you could like potentially get lucky with a one and a half or two million pound like off like bidder and that, and you could get the man. And I think, and obviously apparently he's too good for League One, so he's probably. I mean, he's twenty three year old as well, so he's, it's a perfect opportunity for him to like prove yourself in the championship. And yeah, so I'll be I'll be definitely all over that. Could do with another like versatile fullback, preferably someone like to play right back for competition and back up for Trey Hume and potentially uh, another central midfielder, and that, especially to cope with if you haven't got Job or like what you like mentioned before, like like Jordan Henderson coming back could be a really good like like option if it was to happen if he took a massive like wage cut. Yeah, which and I've said before, I think I could see Henderson doing that. Um, obviously, he's not going to want to go. I want fifty p per week. I want, I want, he probably would want a competitive wage, but I would yeah. reckon for about 15 to 20 grand, I think maybe I'm being deluded, but I think I could see that happening. I could see Henderson coming back because you've got to think, yes, I understand why some people wouldn't want him because he went to Saudi for a few months and I understand that argument. Personally, for me, while I get the moral side of it, it doesn't bother me enough to not want Jordan Henderson back at the club. And I think, but I can see why people would think that. But what I, I think for Henderson... The experience both on and off the pitch he would bring is massive. And I think unless he's massively regressed since he's left Liverpool, which was only a year and a half ago, unless he's ma- unless he's a, a tenth of the player he was then, even at his age, I can't imagine the championship would be too much for him. I don't think it would be. Um, so if he's not getting much game time at Ajax, which obviously if he is, then there's not much chance of us getting him. But I think Henderson, for him, it could be, I've already had all my big pay I've had all the money I wanted. Even without the Saudi money, he'd be a multi-multi-millionaire at this point. For him, it'd probably be about his football at this point. So I'd say Henderson, I think Parkview, I think would be a good shout. And for me, the main one we need, I think, is another right back. I think we need some cover in that position. Uh, But how relieving is it for once not to say striker? Yes, definitely. By the way, again, Butchwood, providing Isidore doesn't get injured, providing we don't get (laughs) the luck we normally get in that sodding position... But I would say that it's the other positions, because it's not a striker, they should be easier and cheaper to recruit, shouldn't they? Even really good level players. Oh, well, definitely. Well, they always say strikers cost the most money. And, that, and, and the fact is that seven goals have come from forwards this season where only three came from strikers last season. Oh, you so tell that me just, that's mad. Yeah, so that just tells you like how the striker situation is working. And we're actually seeing the potential of Meander, like slowly but surely this season, which is obviously a positive going forward and hopefully again I t- in your words touch wood Isidore stays fit and con- contributes to more world class finishes absolutely well I think that just about wraps up what we were going to say I'll just quickly mention this for the Pogu Peterborough thing Peterborough are currently in League 1 the 12th three points off the playoffs so what you probably could do with from a very selfish perspective even though I don't mind Peterborough as a club you could probably do with them falling away a little bit and it means yeah. that they might they might go right, let's cash in on Pogu now. Even if, say, Darren McAnthony, we know how much of a Daniel Levy, League One version of Daniel Levy chairman he is. But he's not going to be in a position to demand very much, is he? With six months left on his contract, the most I could see us having to pay is two, three million quid. And I think Sunderland might think it's worth it. Let's go for it. You know, so we'll wait and see what happens with January. So, quick question. Are Sunderland still going to be in the mix for top two come the start of the January window? By in the mix, I mean up to five points from second? Uh, I, would, I would love to say yes, but I think I'm going to sit... Are you going to sit, sit on that lovely fence? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sit on the fence for the time being. And that's okay. good. But hopefully Fair. we are. Fingers crossed. Right, guys. Um, if you guys are watching and you're not a regular subscriber, as I always say in my enemy videos, and you think I've learned it from you, and if you think that we think we're thin, if, if he's helped, if he's helped you convince you that you've that I've earned another sub, then feel free to sub. I'm trying to get a 6K sub, so it'll be absolutely brilliant. So even getting 6K subs by the end of the season, hopefully a promotion party, but we'll see. Um, fingers crossed, but no, um, thank, I would say subscribe to Thane, but obviously he's not on YouTube anymore. Not in terms of doing videos, but it was nice. But thanks very much for coming on. It was much appreciated. Um, and it was a nice yeah, little, conf- and it was a nice little, all over the place, delayed conversation. But nevertheless, it was still nice. Yeah, 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 I yeah, really enjoyed it. Thanks for like having us on. Yeah, just nice to talk more, like, more positively and be more excited about something this season for a change. Yeah, and not just talking about we'll win the league if we flip the league upside down, like we were in 1718. <laughs> yeah. All the failed seasons in League One not getting promoted. Oh, jeez. No. Do you remember the last con- Do you remember the question I got asked before about if you had to take 10 years in the championship? or go up to the Premier League, 
and then eventually go back down to League One. And we both unanimously, didn't we, said 10 years in the Championship. As much as yes. Premier League where was sustainable, I could never hack League One ever again. No, no, got, no more League One. No more. No. Got too much PTSD no. from that bloody division. But there you go. Right, guys. I'll actually love you and leave you. And um, yeah, the next time we'll see us is the Millwall game, unless anything happens in the weeks to come. Hopefully this doesn't go, well, messed up. And we'll see what happens. But take care, you guys. And Thane, thanks again for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.